Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third uh, Bible study in our series, The Coming Day of the End Times. Um, this evening, we go into a very important subject that I think is quite, um, it, in fact, it's essential, critical to the understanding of the end times, and that is the 70 weeks of Daniel. Um, and there's going to be two parts to this, and I, I think that we need to spend that amount of time for it. The 70 weeks of Daniel refers to a, a portion of scripture in the book of Daniel that is critical, as I've said, to the study and understanding of end times or eschatology. Um, unfortunately, this portion of scripture specifically has been greatly misaligned and misunderstood by many. Much of the abuse I feel ha that has come from this passage has stemmed from a failure to establish exactly what the passage is saying before attempting to ascertain its meaning. The ensuing result of that is a plethora of wild conclusions and conclusions and conjectures that are not actually found within the text or in this passage, nor are they harmonious or consistent with the rest of Scripture and other prophecies concerning the nation of Israel or the end times in general. And so um, it's very important that we understand this portion of Scripture and we approach it correctly. In a nutshell, we might summarize the 70 weeks of Daniel by saying that it is the revelation of God to Daniel that a specific period of time has been decreed or established for the nation of Israel and Jerusalem before he fulfills his covenant promises to them. When we then talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel, we're referring to a prophetic timeline for Israel. Okay, so in a nutshell, the 70 weeks of Daniel is a prophetic timeline for the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. By studying this timeline and this passage, we actually learn a few things. We learn these. When God will fulfill the unconditional promises to the nation of Israel, when the first coming of the Messiah was to take place, okay, in relation to Israel's captivity. So we, we see that. We also see where the church fits in by implication in relation to God's plan and timeline for Israel. We see the Gentile people, empire, or kingdom from which the Antichrist will rise up. Uh, this is identified in, in Daniel chapter 7, um, but it isn't. Daniel chapter 9 really helps us to understand who that people uh, are. Um, next, we see that the, uh, the, we, look, we find out and learn the event that will identify the Antichrist. We also see the sign of the beginning of an unprecedented persecution of the nation of Israel. That sign being that hallmark that even Jesus will point to, to say, run, head for the hills, don't turn back, don't go and pack your bags, run. It is what Jeremiah refers to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, we also see the chronological placement of significant key, key events uh, within the end times calendar, includes, including an, in, an indication as to where the rapture would be, where the tribulation would start and end, and the second coming of Christ, and where that would be in relation to God's program for Israel. And so as we consider these things, we see that this, uh, and I believe that you could no doubt ascertain it from this list, that this is an important section of prophecy to understand in our study of the end times. And it's why I like to begin our study of our end times, uh, barring the introductory portions that we considered in studies one and two, um, this is a good place to start to get a great base upon which we'll build everything else. It is crucial, especially in the light of the many abuses and misuses of this passage, that we carefully study each verse of this passage, taking into account what it is saying to ensure that we have a correct interpretation. Only then, on, uh, upon obtaining a good interpretation of what the text is saying, can we then consider its implications on other biblical prophecies concerning the future. So, due to its importance and the nature of its bedrock status in this study, uh, I've thought it necessary to take it over two parts. The first part, we will consider the program and the scope of the 70 weeks of Daniel, 
as well as the commencement and conclusion of the first 69 weeks. Now that will be time depending. Uh, when I hit 8.30, I want to be sensitive to making sure that we keep this within an hour. So at 8.30, I will, um, I will stop it wherever we might be. And it's just the nature of it. Let's just see how far we get. But the plan is to, to cover those two aspects. In part two, we will then consider the intermission between the 69th week and the 70th week, as well as the recommencement and conclusion of the, the final or the 70th week of Daniel. So basically, I'm splitting it uh, um, according to verses. And verse, uh, verses, uh, part one will deal with verses 24 and 25, and then part two will deal with, uh, deal with 26 and 27. Now, having taught this um, passage a number of times, I want to begin by letting you know that this is not an easy passage to understand, and it can be quite confusing. But I want to just, just encourage you to hang in there and to take the time to wrestle through it, because it will really help you to understand the many other biblical prophecies that we are going to consider down the line. So hang in there. With that being said, turn with me in your Bibles, if you have it, to the book of Daniel. Uh, it's one of the major prophets, so it's after Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then you're going to hit Daniel. Daniel, and I'd like you to go to chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And I want to read verses 24 through to verse 27. Okay. Daniel chapter 9. And verse 24 through 27. And, and I just want to encourage you, have your Bible open up to it. It's, it is important that we, because we're going to go through this, uh, this passage step by step. And um, I'd, I'd like you to be able to follow along with me. I will put it up on the screen as well for those watching the video. But let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through to verse 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the King, um, uh, Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war desolate, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, depending on what version you have and what you're reading from, it might say something slightly different towards the end there. And we'll deal with those and those, those variances as and when we get there. So... Um, what I would like to begin with is then first looking at the program um, and scope of the 70 weeks itself. Um, so let's begin by looking at um, verse 24. So Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Look at what it says. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, this verse sums up pretty much. Uh, I gave you my nut nutshell definition at the beginning in my introduction. But this verse in verse 24 really uh, encapsulates what the 70 weeks of Daniel is. If we can understand this verse, we're more than halfway there in understanding this portion of Scripture. The structure of the sentence, if we have a look at the sentence and those items there that have underlined, 
the structure of the sentence might be paraphrased like this. A time period, namely 70 weeks, has been determined for your people and city, upon thy people and thy holy city. And then we see a list. Notice how there's all these twos. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation, to bring in, to seal up, to anoint. Okay? We see all of those twos. And we can really paraphrase that or, or boil that down to accomplishing or finishing a list of things or the following things. So paraphrasing it down, we, basically the statement is saying a time frame or time period has been determined for a certain people group, okay, and he says your people in your holy city to accomplish or finish these things. That is what he's saying and why, what the angel Gabriel is saying here. So a time period has been determined for a group of people to accomplish these things. All right. And thus, there are three important things that are addressed in this verse. The time period or the time frame in question, the people for whom the time frame is determined, and the things that will be fully accomplished at the conclusion of that time frame. And we need to just take a moment for each of one of these three. I want to just spend a little bit of time in trying to understand what is the time frame, who are the people, and what are these things that are to be accomplished. And then we'll have a good understanding of what verse 24 is really saying. Okay, so let's deal with the first one. Okay, the time frame. It declares here that it is 70 weeks are determined upon thy people in thy holy city. Okay, so before we can fully understand the extent of this time frame and what is meant by this time frame, we need to understand what the Bible means by the word week. Okay. The word week is the Hebrew word Shavua, okay, and is determined by Strong's and other lexicons as being literally mean, means seven or seven, okay. It refers to a heptad, a period of seven units of time. It could be seven days. It, it can uh, be a reference to a normal week as we would use the term, a period of seven days. Or it can also refer to any kind of seven units of time period, including seven years. Okay. So um, we could then understand it if because the word Shavua literally means seven, we could actually translate this instead of saying 70 weeks, which can be confusing, and which is one of the reasons why it's it's a source of confusion. Is just some of the terminology in the English translation. It literally means 70 sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's really what, it, uh, um, what it's saying. 70 sevens, which leaves us with the question of what? Seven what? Is it seven days? Is it seven weeks? Is it seven years? Um, is it is this merely a symbolic reference when it talks about 77s? Is it just merely symbolism um, of an indefinite time period that has been put here? So I want to I want us to consider um, this. I just want to see what my next um, slide is. No, let's just care. Let me just answer some of these questions as to what is it? What is in re reference here? Is it is it days? Is it weeks? Is it is it years? Is it uh, symbolic? Now, some view this reference to a period of seven as merely symbolic uh, time period, not a literal one. You'll find this much amongst the Reformed, the R Millennial. Um, uh, if they if they lean to any kind of Reformed position, generally speaking, they will approach this uh, at seventy weeks as Daniel as being mostly just symbolic. Um, but the problem with viewing this as just a symbolic reference or of an undetermined time period is both consistency and context. When God prophetically defines or declares a duration of time, it is always fulfilled literally, whether it was in reference to the birth of Isaac, whether it was in reference to the captivity of Israel uh, in Egypt, which he prophesied to, to um, Abraham in Genesis, uh, the time period before the destruction of the world by the flood at the times of Noah being 120 years, uh, 
the duration of the time of that Christ would be in the grave, three days, the duration of Antiochus Epiphanes' oppression of, of Israel, 2,300 days, the duration of Israel's captivity in Babylon of 70 years. We always find that when the Bible gives specific times to, in biblical prophecy, they are fulfilled literally. Furthermore, if you look at verse 25 of Daniel chapter 9, notice that it then starts dividing it up into specific divisions. And even later in verse 27, it identifies the last division. But here in verse 25, notice that it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens or weeks, and, and three score and two weeks, or 62 sevens or weeks, okay? So we find here that this is now, this, this time period of 70 sevens is being divided up into other divisions. Now, any division of a symbolic time period is meaningless. As, as you cannot put def, def, definite points of time on an indefinite period of time. Why would you then establish a symbolic indefinite period of time and then within that in symbolic indefinite period of time, divide it up into definitive time periods? It's not, that's not the way, it, it's not the way you would treat a symbolic reference of time. Verse 25 here actually treats this as a literal duration of time with intervals defined by, by commencement and conclusion dates that are determined by literal events that happen at a point in time. Those are the hallmarks and qualities of a literal time period, not a symbolic one. And we'll even see, based upon the context here within the chapter of Daniel, chapter 9, that uh, the context would also militate or argue against a symbolic interpretation of this phrase, seven, okay? Likewise, in reference to, is it days? The known time of, uh, if it was days, it would be saying that there are 70 periods of seven days, okay? That would make it uh, 490 days. Okay, that's what 77s would then be, 70 weeks as we understand week would be 490 days, okay? Uh, seven days times 70, that's 490 days. If that is the intended meaning, that's, we have a problem because the known time of Christ's first coming in ministry, as well as other prophetic scripture, and as, as well as the events described within this passage, discounts this possibility that the word week here refers to a period of seven days. Prophecies in Daniel chapter 10 and 11 and 12 that follow Daniel chapter 9 alone would require hundreds of years to be fulfilled. Similarly, the events outlined in this passage make such a, an interpretation uh, ludicrous because it would mean that within 490 days, just under a year and a half, it would, that, it, it would declare that the city would be rebuilt, the Messiah would come, the Messiah would be cut off, the temple would, and city would be destroyed, a covenant would be established and then broken, and an abomination of desolation would be set up, and God would fulfill all his covenants with Israel. Now, if you just break down each one of those, I mean, the, uh, Jesus' public ministry was three years let alone his lifespan of over 30. So already you've got a huge problem here based upon the other um, portions of scripture here. It cannot refer to a, a period of seven days. Okay, Thus the most likely and the best interpretation of this word Shavua is that it refers to a period of seven years. And this interpretation is actually very well supported and corroborated in the context. And it fits within the content of this prophecy, as well as other prophetic scripture. And I would like us to take a moment just to consider, just, to, just briefly, what the context is here in Dan Daniel chapter 9, 
that, ri that gives rise to this, this vision that, and this revelation that is given to Daniel. Now, the context here is that before Gabriel was sent to deliver this revelation to Daniel, Daniel was confessing his sins and the sins of, of the people. He was giving confession, which I preached on, you know, maybe a couple of months back. Daniel was calling upon the mercy and the deliverance of God for his name's sake. And we see that in verse 20. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of, of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking and praying, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me at about the time of the evening ablation. So here within the context here, you see there in verse 20 that he's praying and confessing his sins, okay? Now this prayer for mercy was aligned to God's will and in accordance with God's word and testimony, which he gave through the, the, mouth, of the word, uh, 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 mouth of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, look at verse 2 of Daniel chapter 9. And I put it there up on your screen if you don't have a Bible with you. Notice what it says. And this is really at the beginning of this chapter. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by, the bo uh, by books, the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, Daniel had been in captivity um, for about uh, 66 to 67 years. Now, this, this is the first, this is just after Babylon had been conquered. Okay, this is, uh, as verse 1 says, it's first year of Darius, which would have been un the uncle um, of, of Cyrus, who was essentially established in control of the satrap of, of, of Babylonia, or Babylon, um, un still under Cyrus, but, but was essentially labeled king of that area. So this would be after uh, Babylon has been overthrown. And so we're looking at about 539 BC. And it's at this time that, that um, um, da Daniel here has been considering the scriptures and the prophecies that God gave to another prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Okay. He had been, uh, Daniel had been in captivity for about 66 to 67 years, close to about 70 years that he had been in captivity from about 605 BC. And thus knew, according to God's word, that the end of their captivity was near. This prompted uh, Daniel's prayer for mercy and forgiveness. And this timeline is well established within Jeremiah 25. Um, I've got it here. I'm just going to read from verse 8 through 12, but I've got there up on your screen 11 through 12 there on the slide. Um, verse 8 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and an hissing, and, a perpetu and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them uh, the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle, and this whole land shall be a desolation, and an astonishment. And these nations, as you can see here in verse 11, where I've underlined, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. So what we see here is that God declares and has prophesied to Judah through the mouth of Jeremiah that they would go into captivity uh, beginning with Jehoiakim in 605 BC, that was when Daniel went into captivity, which was where we, which we see in Daniel chapter one. That's when Daniel went uh, into exile, was um, or, or into captivity rather. 
was under the reign of Jehoiakim on the third year or fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. And so um, God prom uh, prophesied through the mouth of Jeremiah that, that they would go into captivity and be in captivity for 70 years. And after that, he would then judge um, Babylon. Now, we see a reference to this in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, after the final deportation. There were three deportations in God's judgment of Judah. The first was at 605, I think the second was at 587, um, or the last one was at 587. The other one was, I think, at 597 or somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, or oh, 598, around there, anyway. Um, but there were three de deportations. Um, but note at the, at the end of this, um, we see a statement here in 2 Chronicles 36, kind of summary, summar, summarizing this, but also giving us an indication as to why God said that they would be in captivity for 70 years. Have you ever asked the question, if you knew about they would go into captivity for 70 years, why they would be in captivity for 70 years? Why choose that number? Why did God say that that's how long they would be there? Well, 2 Chronicles 36 actually helps us to understand why it was 70 years. And it's very pertinent to understanding the 70 weeks of Daniel. Look at what it says here in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 17 to 21. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the, in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And then that had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons and, and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia, kingdom of Persia. Now notice verse 21 here. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years or 70 years, okay? Now, what's very interesting here is the significance of the time frame that is indicated by the Lord. The Lord declares here that the, the land will enjoy its Sabbaths for a period of 70 years. Now, why is that significant? That's a very easy statement to just kind of gloss over when you're reading through your Bible, but it's very, very important. And there's a reason why God put it there. Okay. God had given a law uh, to the nation of Israel, which stated that the land was to lie fallow every seven years. Okay. And it was so called the land Sabbath. We see it in Leviticus 25 verses one through seven. Have a look at what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. A Sabbath for the Lord, thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourned with thee and for thy cattle. And for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. All right. So based upon this law, every seven years, the land was to be rested. Okay. So if I'm just to have a look, if you can see my cursor here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Can you see it? Okay, good. So according to the law here, 
it says that that on the there would be six years in which they would then harvest and work the land okay so six years but on the seventh year they were not to work so or or reap from the land they could take uh, and pick the food that grows up of its own accord you know for their daily needs and sustenance for their servants for their maids etc and even for the stranger that lives in the land okay but they were not to work the land it was a year of rest for the land so there was a period for every period of seven years there was one sabbath year now god said in second chronicles 36 that we had just read that the period of 70 years was to fulfill this law evidently israel had never observed or kept this law okay they they still on the seventh year worked the land uh, sowed and reaped and they never there's no indication in all of scripture during the time of the judges or the kings that ever declares that they observed the sabbath year and god was thus redeeming that time the time that they should have given to the year to lie at rest he then says yeah, i am going to reclaim that you are going to be in captivity for 70 years in order to fulfill the land sabbaths this means that there was 70 periods of seven years where the land sabbath was not observed in order to get to 70 years of captivity to fulfill 70 land sabbaths it meant that there had to be 70 periods of seven years in which Israel did not observe this, okay? Now that's important, okay? Because that's 490 years, 70 sevens, the basis of which formed the, the time of their captivity. And thus, as the 70 years of captivity are coming to a close in which they are have fulfilled all of the land Sabbaths, God then reveals to Daniel that there is going to be another 70 periods of seven years or 490 years for the nation of Israel until the consummation of all the promises that he has made to them. Okay. So when we consider the immediate context here, which revolves around the 70 years of captivity, the 70 years of captivity was determined by Israel's dis disobedience for 70 periods of seven years where they did not observe the land Sabbath. God redeemed those land Sabbaths. And at the conclusion of that captivity, he says to Daniel, there's going to be another 70 sevens that are decreed for thy people and for thy holy city. That would mean that what is the time frame that's in reference here, according to verse 24, 77 refers to a time period of 490 years, 70 times seven, seven years, okay? Period of seven years, 490 years. So that's what we're looking for. The time frame in question is 490 years. So we could then interpret the, this verse in, in this way. 490 years are decreed for thy people and thy holy city to do the following. Okay. Which brings us to the next thing that we need to consider. And that is the people for whom the time frame is determined. Notice what it says there in verse 24. 77 or weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. All right. Now, within the book of Daniel itself, the prophecies, there's a lot of the prophecies within this book are, with the exception of maybe Daniel, chapter 9 and even, you know, well, even Daniel chapter 8, Daniel 10, 11, and 12 all also include or, or and focus upon prophecies that relate to the Gentiles and Gentile nations. We see it in chapter 2. It's all about the Gentile kingdoms. Daniel chapter 7, Gentile kingdoms. Dan Daniel chapter 8, Greece and Medo-Persia. Daniel chapter, chapter 11, 
we're dealing with uh, the Greeks, uh, Persia, the Greeks, the Seleucids, and the Ptolemies, uh, as well as a reference to uh, the Antichrist and his kingdom later on. In contrast, however, this prophecy concerning this 490 years, the 70 weeks, is specifically identified for Daniel's people. Who are Daniel's people? He says, it's your people and your holy city. So who does this refer to? Well, Daniel's people are the nation of Israel. They are Jews. Similarly, Daniel's holy city, the, the city which he would face when he prayed to God three times a day, the place of utmost esteem for all of Israel where the temple resided was the, and the place where the Messiah would rule is none other than Jerusalem. So this 490 years has a focus on Israel and Israel's key city, Jerusalem. All right. Now, this is very, very, please, this is very important. We need to take, uh, uh, take uh, um, uh, focus upon this, okay, uh, and really take um, a moment to consider the implication of this. It's very important that we don't take this for granted. The 70 weeks are meant only for the nation of Israel. This time period that is, in, is being in, is referred to here does not involve any Gentile at all. The Gentiles are not involved in this time frame. Okay, it doesn't mean that Gentiles aren't on earth. They are, and they're doing things, and they're nations, and there's kingdoms. But this time frame uh, that is being referred to here is focused upon Israel and Jews and Jerusalem. No one else. It is important then to note that the church has no part of, claim to, or involved in the 70 weeks or this 490 years at all. And the reason I'm stressing that is because the moment, and there are numerous that would then include that this applies to the church. It doesn't. The church is in no way in view here. Remember, the church was a mystery to the Old Testament saints and Old Testament prophecy. They knew that the Gentiles would be grafted in and that God would, would take out from the Gentiles a people for his name's sake, as, as James um, makes mention of in Acts chapter 15. They, they understood that, but the advent of the church and the organization or the organism of the church, they didn't have any idea because the Old Testament prophecies didn't make mention of it. Okay, it was a mystery, as Paul calls it, something that was previously not revealed, but is now been revealed. And so here, there is no application to the church at all. And the moment people start applying this to the church is where this goes horribly wrong. They get confused and you can find some crazy uh, predictions and interpretations that come out of it. Okay. So please, we need to walk away from this understanding that the people for whom this is determined is for Israel. Um, and this exclusivity for Israel also refers to these important promises at the end, where it says to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting and righteousness, to seal that vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Those things there, those objection, uh, uh, objectives and conclusions do not involve the church and do not involve the Gentile nations. Those are specific to Israel. To, to just illustrate this very quickly, where it says here to seal up the vision and prophecy, for, <clears throat> for the church, we have received prophecy within the book of Revelation that extends to the eternal state. It involves the millennium, but it also involves beyond the millennium to the final rebellion, the great white throne judgment, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. So really, our prophecy that the church has received within the book of Revelation extends beyond Christ's earthly kingdom upon the earth 
to the eternal state and the new heaven and the new earth. And it even gives particulars of that. Now, uh, when it says here to seal up the vision and the prophecy, for whom? We've got prophecy that leads all the way to et the eternal state. But for Israel, that finishes the Old Testament prophecy. Its culmination of Old Testament prophecy is the messianic kingdom of Christ. The coming of Christ to establish his kingdom upon the earth. All of Old Testament prophecy is focused upon that point. Okay? And thus, at the coming of that, that messianic kingdom, Christ's kingdom upon the earth, that is a fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy as it relates to the nation of Israel. It also makes an, a, a, um, a point here to make an end of sins. Now, we know, according to Revelation, as we're going to discuss, that at the end of the millennial reign of King, uh, uh, the millennial reign of Christ, his kingdom upon the earth, there's going to be an uprising of the Gentiles against God. And that's an act of wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so we still see sin occurring, you know, at the conclusion of the millennium time frame. But what it states here, to make an end of sins and rebellion, pertains to Israel, because Israel will never participate in any more rebellion against God. It is complete. At the second coming of Christ, Christ will, uh, God will establish and fulfill his new covenant with Israel. His law will be written upon their hearts and minds, and they will be completely cleansed from sin. And so that is the promises of the new covenant. And so when it states here, all these objectives of what's going to be accomplished, and this time frame specifically, it relates to Israel. It is them that is in focus here. And that's an important thing for us always to keep in mind as we progress through this passage. Which brings us to the last thing in this verse, which is what is going to be accomplished here. Um, at the end of this, this 490 years that is decreed for Israel. You'll notice there by the, uh, the preposition to, okay? The preposition to here, there are six things that are mentioned here that are going to be accomplished by the end of this 490 years. And if we just go through these six things, it is to finish the transgression, okay? Literally to restrain or to shut up rebellion, God will stop all of Israel's rebellion. And that really focuses upon the second coming of Christ, where God then says, I will plead with you in Ezekiel chapter 20. He says, I will plead with you in the wilderness as I pleaded with your forefathers. And I will purge, the, I'll cause you to come and go under the rod and purge out from under you, from amongst you, the rebels. He's going to bring an end to Israel's rebellion. Okay, at the end of this 490 years. Likewise, coupled with that, he says, I will make an end of sin. That means to completely close up the offense or sin against God in the nation of Israel. He's going to remove that. He says, I will make reconciliation for iniquity. And that means to cover or to atone for iniquity or perversity. In other words, he is going to satisfy and appease God, God is going to be satisfied and appeased um, for man's wickedness and unrighteousness. Where do we see that satisfaction of God's wrath? We see it in, um, it's, it's pointed to in Romans chapter 3, where it says that Christ, Christ's death upon the cross and his blood, his shedding of his blood was a propitiation. And that the word propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. Christ's death upon the cross and his shedding of his blood satisfied God's wrath for man's sin. So within this 490 years, he is going to make a reconciliation for iniquity, essentially satisfy and appease God's wrath for wickedness and unrighteousness. It also says here that he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. To bring in righteousness from vanishing points. You know, that's the word everlasting. To veil from sight. It's an everlasting, you know, a vanishing point beyond what the eye can see. He is going to establish righteousness within the nation of Israel, you know, 
with no end in sight to the vanishing point to the everlasting he's going to establish righteousness in israel and when you look at the the terms of the new covenant both in jeremiah 31 and ezekiel 36 it is establishing a righteousness within the nation of israel that is forever they will never more rebel against god turn to idolatry or, but would be perfect in their walk, knowing God. They would no longer need to teach and, and proclaim and exhort the people of Israel to know God because they will all, from the smallest to the greatest of them, know God. Okay? So he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness into the nation of Israel. He's also going to seal up vision and prophecy. That means to close up or to make an end of prophecy. And we'll even see that when it comes to um, uh, the end of Daniel chapter 12, where it says, close up and seal this book. And it's pointing to the ultimate end of the coming, uh, the end of the time of, of Israel's trouble and the coming of Christ's messianic kingdom. He, this is going to be at the end of this 490 years, a fulfillment of all of those prophecies and promises that have been made to the nation of Israel. And then lastly, it says to anoint the most holy, to anoint or to consecrate the most holy place. Okay, that doesn't, it, um, uh, to sanctify Jerusalem, it's in the new to there, you know, most holy, it, it kind of doesn't say one could say the most holy one some would interpret that as being a reference to the messiah but it also probably most likely refers to uh, the city of jerusalem for whom this time period is determined to sanctify jerusalem and the temple for its king and its people um, when we consider the anointing of the tabernacle in exodus 49 um, uh, 40 and verse 9 and verse 34 and the promise of Ezekiel uh, 37. Um, it's, it's likely this could be in reference to um, the city of Jerusalem as well as the temple specifically, the most holy place that God will anoint with his presence. But this may also refer to, as some have intimated, to the anointing of Jesus as the antitype of the temple um, like John chapter 2, uh, Christ uses that kind of metaphor referring to his body. But I personally think that it's, it's in reference to anointing the temple, uh, Jerusalem and the temple that resides within it. But if we, when we consider all of these six, everything promised to Israel, whether, and we looked at this in this last study, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant, all of the terms of those covenants, um, when those are fulfilled, will fulfill these six things. Whether it's Abraham, you know, and fulfilling all the promises and having them enter into the land, the new covenant and their, their complete salvation, Christ sitting upon the throne, all of those promises, those prophecies, um, all of that, it will essentially be fulfilled at the end of this 490 years. There will be no sin in all of Israel, and Christ, the anointed one, will sit on the throne of David and his everlasting kingdom. So when we look here at verse 24, what we see here is that there is a specific time period that is determined for a specific group of individuals in order to accomplish a certain number of things. And as we look at these things, we see that the time frame in question is a period of 490 years, 70 sevens or 70 periods of seven years for Israel and Jerusalem to accomplish all of God's promises and covenants for them. Okay, so that deals with verse 24. And if we can get and understand just that. The rest of it is going to be a little bit easier for us to understand, as well as the implications of it. And would you know it, we've now hit hot post eight, which means that we've come to an end here. And so this is where I'm going to end it, rather than going into the, the first 69 weeks. What we'll do next week is we'll then go and, and, and drill down into verse 25, um, and, and we'll see if I, I'll try and get in verse 25, 26, and 27 um, in one go um, that deals with the first 69 weeks as well as the last 
week as well as the intermission between these two. So next week in the next study, part two of this, this study, we will then consider when does it start, how is it divided up, what marks its starting point, what marks the intermission, what marks the, the beginning or the recommencement of the last period of seven years. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for, for coming in. It's now gone half past eight. So I'm going to leave it there uh, and we'll conclude our part one of our study here. And we will uh, continue on next week.